Dinosaurs will not be seen tonight, so that we may bring you the following Channel 10 special presentation. felt on a basketball court I can do any, any and everything that I've seen anybody else do and still add a few new twists that were mine on my own. He can hang around a few more years if he wanted to, but hanging around is not what he's about. The only hanging around he's ever done is around the rim for seemingly hours at a time. Dr. Jane Walker slam and reverse. Black shot, assist. I've come back. Doc, the Julius Irving story, is sponsored in part by Miller Beer, made the American way since 1885, and by your local Midas muffler and brake shop. No one can throw a party like the fans of Philadelphia. I come back, not as a player, but as a fan, as a spectator, as a citizen, that I could know in my heart and physically see up in the rafters signs of this organization becoming a family. That's the only thing that's missing right now. And it's not a great request, because this is the city of brotherly love and sisterly affection. Hello, I'm Al Meltzer. Hard to believe that Julius Irving has played his final regular season game right here in the Spectrum. So emotional, so memorable. It was really a night I think all of us were hoping would never get here. Selfish perhaps, but who wants to see such a brilliant basketball career come to an end? Sure, there's still the playoffs, but Sixer fans now find themselves in a position similar to those who have honored him around the NBA. Realizing the end of an era of excellence is now at hand. Thanks, Thanks Doc. Doc. The Dr. J farewell tour had to be the biggest of its kind in sports history. Every team and their fans wanted to say thank you, but not goodbye. They expressed what they felt for Judas from the heart, honoring him in ceremonies where he received many gifts, some of which were serious, others humorous. <laughs> The city of Seattle was rocking in February as the King Dome was the site for the Doctor's final All-Star Game appearance. Yeah, it's going to be a very special day because it's Doc's last All-Star Game and we're pretty psyched up about that, so we'll probably go to him a lot today and see what he can do. The league's top players wanted the Doctor's star to shine the brightest. Michael Jordan, who was most often compared to Dr. J, was the leading vote-getter by the fans. He got to start the game in the backcourt with Julius though he had volunteered to bench himself in favor of Doc if the situation called for it. It was very exciting, you know. It was more or less, I wanted him to win MVP. And, you know, I was playing a point guard position, which was not my natural position. But, you know, I got the fun of just starting with him and playing with him in his last game. And, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm just happy and elated that I got that opportunity. Julius never missed an All-Star game in his 16-year career and was a starter in the last 15. The 1987 All-Star Game was very special to him because it provided one last chance for him to team up with Moses Malone. Moses Malone! Uh, you know, Doc, he played great in the All-Star Game. And um, it's just contribute, you know, to play with Doc one more time. The full impact of the farewell tour on Sixers fans had to come on Doc's last trip to the Boston Garden. The Celtics and their fans paid tribute to Julius in a way which added warmth and class to that bitter rivalry. They offered him a piece of the famed parquet floor, a clock, and most of all, their respect. We've made some mistakes over the years 
and so is he. And the biggest one is the fact that we never had him in Celtic Green. While growing up, the doctor dreamed of playing for the New York Knicks in Madison Square Garden. A sick touch for his finale there included having a number of famous doctors on call. First of all, I just said that I think you're doing a brilliant oh, yeah. by retiring when you are right on top. <laughs> Why, thank you very much. And I brought your book. <laughs> because now that you will play less ball, you can have, have more time, time for sex. <laughs> Aside from being given a trip or two to Australia, this was truly a heartwarming testimonial shared by Julius and Turquoise Irving because they began their life together in New York. Julius was presented with aspirin signed by players around the league for the many headaches he caused them on the court. The Forrest Kelly, Star Trek's Dr. McCoy, offered the special handshake for Dr. J as he's off into a new frontier. Meanwhile, the Knicks and their fans could only think about what might have been. Perhaps the most touching moment on the tour for Julius himself came when his old team honored him. Though they're now in New Jersey and not New York, the Nets and their fans reminisced about their days atop the ABA with Dr. J. They gave him a car, brought in his family, old teammates, and broke down their hero with the highest compliment of all. Julius Irving's jersey number 32 is now officially retired. A game with the Washington Bullets brought an end to the Dr. J farewell tour. However, such a long road to retirement would seem incomplete without a warm homecoming to cap it off. The love affair between Philadelphia and Dr. J is far from over. His number six will be retired by the Sixers in a ceremony early next season. And placed right here in front of the spectrum, there will be a statue of Julius Irving, which will serve as a permanent tribute to the man who will hold a place in our hearts forever. We love you, Dr. J. I love you, Dr. J. Dr. J, you're over the rainbow, and you're definitely a winner, and I love you. Yeah, I actually uh, discovered uh, Julius Irving. I got him started in basketball. See. He's from Long Island, and uh, he was in a band with me, and uh, played the bass, and, you know, you, you wouldn't think it, but the guy had absolutely no rhythm at all. Terrible. He's a gentleman, you know, when I, but when I first met him, uh, Julius was working in a small club in Long Island as a comedian, under his real name, which is Erwin Lippenstein. Did you know that? Okay. We all know that he went on to play basketball. No offense to Billy and Billy. But we did some of our own digging into Dr. J's beginning and found out that there was a nine-pound, eight-ounce baby boy born February 22, 1950, who the nurses called Pork Chop. Julius Winfield Irving was a quiet, obedient kid, second in a family of three children growing up in Long Island. His parents were separated, and Julius was only nine when his father passed away. His mother had to work hard to support and raise her children. I'm not going to say that we were poor because we had health. Financially, I would say maybe we were. But uh, we had a lot that a lot of the rich people didn't have, and that was togetherness and love. Unfortunately, that Irving family togetherness, which Julius knew as a child, is now only shared between him and his mother. His sister Alexis, who was three years older, died in 1984 of cancer. Marvin, who was three years younger than his brother, died of lupus when Julius was a freshman in college. His mother says as a child, Julius talked of being a basketball player and also a cop. He says he also had other dreams. I said early uh, someday that uh, I would win the Pulitzer Prize as a kid and that I would have uh, money, fame, 
and I would have a family that I was proud of. I'm glad that he did choose something that could make him be somebody. She didn't expect him to become the superstar of whom she's so proud. And to her, he's still just Julius Irving, her son. People make more of it than I do, really, because I still look at him as, as he says, Junior. He don't like me to say that, you know, because <laughs> he laughed, you know, but then he don't like me to say Dr. J. In around ninth grade, this buddy who I used to play with, uh, he started calling me the doctor because I called him the professor. And the reason I was calling him the professor is more of a story to his nickname than to mine because uh, I called him the professor because he used to lecture to all the kids and he was a very talkative guy, very persuasive. And he reminded me of a high school or college professor, and I called him the professor, and I would do it, and um, and he just kind of reciprocated and gave me a nickname. He said, "Well, if I'm the professor, you be the doctor." A longtime friend says there's more to that story. The parents and grandparents were disappointed because they always wanted him to be a doctor. So even though he he was a comic for a while, and then uh, you know playing as a musician, they refused to acknowledge that, um, and they said, "No, you're a doctor." Yeah, you know, what Jewish son should not be a doctor. Julius attended school in Roosevelt, New York. It should come as no surprise that he was popular and stayed out of trouble. He was an excellent student. Uh, he was a quiet boy. He did all his work. He's the kind of a student you enjoy having in class. A, a student you could, uh, let's say, laugh with. Early in my early years, uh, followed more than led, although uh, I was very careful where I would follow people too, you know, going into uh, smoking and drinking or hanging out and things like that, which, you know, kids experience, uh, you know, I became more of a loner and uh, tried to stay away from things that would be counterproductive to my development as a student and as an athlete. His high school coach was Ray Wilson, a father figure to Julius, who three years ago became his business manager. I really didn't know how good Julius was going to, to be. I thought he was going to be a very good high school player, but I certainly didn't think that um, 10 years from that point he'd be a professional player that the whole country, I mean the whole world, was talking about. Uh, Julius was pretty heavily recruited. I think Julius had a sense of control in a sense of what he wanted from a college or what he was looking for so that there were many schools eliminated Julius chose to become a business major at the University of Massachusetts. In his sophomore year, he was joined by Ray Wilson, who became an assistant coach under his old college teammate, Jack Lehman. Uh, he was like a young colt. He had long, thin legs, long, thin arms. He had the greatest pair of hands I ever saw in my life. Entering college, standing six, three and a half, Julius was projected as a guard. But after 24 rebounds in his first game, he was moved to forward. He learned the game as a small player, as a guard, small forward, and then grew into a big player, six foot six, six foot six and a half. And uh, he had all the skills that he had to have. He just called a touch ball, they rip off our arm. Come on! Although he coached the women at UMass this year, Lehman remembers one young man, so special to him. He was probably the most team-oriented player I ever coached. Uh, the one thing that, that we tried to do was make him even more flamboyant than he was. Following Julius to Massachusetts was Al Skinner, who later became his teammate in the ABA and NBA. He, when we was first starting out, he was kind of lazy because he just laid in bed and all he did was prepare for the games. Oh, but was he ready? And so were the thousands of people who lined up outside this gym hours before each of Julius Irving's games. Although he was probably the greatest athlete to ever play at the University of Massachusetts, he was probably the most popular young man to ever go to school there also. I mean, I know that he went to school with hundreds and hundreds of people who did not know he was a great athlete. After his junior year, Judas postponed the classroom in favor of the pros, leaving a college career in which he averaged over 26 points and 20 rebounds a game in two varsity seasons. Though they still see each other from time to time, like they did after Junior's final game in Boston, Lehman will never forget the phone call 16 years ago 
when he heard that Julius was no longer his player. And I asked a few things like, uh, you know, did the gym burn down? Uh, did anybody flunk out of school? Did my wife leave? And I remember him saying, no, worse than that. And I said, oh, my Lord, what could be worse than that? He said, I think Julius is leaving. Well, I caught the next plane back, and uh, we talked a lot about it, and uh, it certainly was the right decision for him at the time. I didn't really love the idea of him coming out of school that last year, but that was a promise he had made, too. He says, I'm going to try it. He said, because really, I have learned in school what I really need now. Judas fulfilled that promise to himself and his mother recently when he earned his business degree from the University of Massachusetts. Signing a four-year, half-million-dollar contract with the Virginia Squires, the doctor became Dr. J. After leading the league in scoring his second year, Julius was sold to the New York Nets. And I became more of a leader of the team, had more responsibilities as captain, more strategic responsibilities, became a little more complete. My confidence reached a height where I felt on a basketball court I can do any, any and everything that I've seen anybody else do and still add a few new twists that were mine on my own. Dr. J also had a style and appearance all his own. And he's very conscious of his big front, so, uh, uh, you know, he spent a lot of minutes in the mirror, you know, tackling it up, trying to get it together, get it in line, and we go out on the court, get all wild and fuzzy, but at that time, he didn't care. Uh, but uh, he's probably a little more vain than, than, than people would realize, even though he, I guess he's overcome that a little bit because he hasn't been using a Grecian lately. In three seasons as a net, the doctor won three MVP awards and led the team to championships in 1974 and 76. Now it is Doctor with the ball. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Gets it off. It is off. Oh! Last year, the ABA, when we won the championship, our second championship, I thought he put in his final year as any basketball player has ever played. When we return, we'll look at how Julius Irving came to Philadelphia and instantly became one of us. Dr. J, the man's a legend. One of a kind. God bless him. University of Massachusetts, number six, captain of the Philadelphia 76ers, Julius the Doctor Irving. Following the NBA-ABA merger, Julius Irving arrived in Philadelphia in October of 1976 as the six million dollar man. Half of that amount went to signing him, the other half to purchasing his rights from the Nets, where he was a holdout. How he got here is a story in itself. The new owner was Fitz Dixon, and I said, Fitz, we have an opportunity uh, to purchase Julius Irving. And I, I will never forget Fitz's response. He said, tell me, Pat, who is Julius Irving? And Fitz, listen, Fitz laughs about it to this day. And, and, and I said, Fitz, let me best describe him as the Babe Ruth of basketball. And, and Fitz said, uh, all right, go get it done. He did, thereby setting the scene for the great experiment. Dr. J was already a superstar when he became a Sixer. Many, including Coach Gene Shu, felt mixed emotions about the arrival of such a big chief. Why? Because the team was already successful with Big Mac. I don't anticipate having any problems playing uh, with Big George or any of the other players. From the outset, the fans and media put the heat on the 76-77 Sixers a team which was loaded with talent. The whole attitude of the, the press in those days was that the team will now go undefeated. <laughs> However, the saying that you can't rush greatness held true as the Sixers lost their first three games with Dr. J. Doc and George, uh, the combination of those two players was not 
uh, what you would say your perfect combination as players go because they were so similar. Both players had such great respect for each other that uh, they would not let the combination fail. I think I had to sacrifice a lot of what I could individually do just to blend in with the first team that I played on and to uh, uh, conform to the style of play that was best suited for that team to be successful. Doug Collins, now coach of the Chicago Bulls, played on the Sixers team during the first year with Julia. He definitely upgraded the talent of the team, but I think also with him on the floor, we always felt like we could win. And I think that uh, it's the same thing with the Michael Jordan. You feel like if you're in the game, this guy is capable of giving you a solid burst to help you win the basketball game. They won 50 games in their division that year and went on to the championship finals against the Portland Trailblazers. My most vivid memories are of, of that series are all the junks Dr. J threw down, and not only on me, but on our entire team. Bill Walton led Jack Ramsey's team to the title, defeating the Sixers four games to two. Typical of Julius Irving's efforts in the final game, in the sixth game, where we won the championship, uh, and the money was on the line, and everybody had to play his best. He had 40. One season later, George McGinnis was traded to Denver in the Bobby Jones deal. I always felt that that was a team that should have been kept together. I thought that uh, uh, the management really uh, broke that team up way too soon. Billy Cunningham took over as coach and the Sixers became Doc's team, with him leading them to the playoffs each year. If Bill Cunningham, the coach, had the chance to coach Bill Cunningham, the player, one of two things would have to happen. Either he would have to change drastically or I'd get rid of him. Just the opposite scenario, talking about Julius Irving. He was just so receptive in the locker room and practice, but he was as fierce a competitor as I've ever seen in my life. In the 1980 finals, Julius made what could have been his greatest shot ever. It was the most unbelievable play I've ever seen. And we all sat there and looked at each other like, Let's ask him to do it again. <laughs> you know, it was, it was like, did he actually do that? You know, everybody was just caught and stunned. Jazz musician Grover Washington Jr. has been inspired by his good friend, in particular, with that one incredible shot. And, and I told him after the game, you have a song coming for that one. You know, and the tempo of the tune, uh, Let It Flow, I have sort of found by just bouncing a basketball. shot seen around the world the next day um, I think it got overexposed uh, if you're gonna lose a war you might as well win a few battles <laughs> so that could be termed a battle won even though we lost the war in 1982 the Sixers made it back to the finals where the championship eluded them once more they fell to the Los Angeles Lakers in six games well he's got great athletic skills uh, good work I think he kept working at his game and wasn't ever satisfied with where everything was at. He always trying to improve. I'll never forget the first year when Julius sat in the locker room and cried at the sixth game at the LA Lakers. I made up my mind then that I'm going to do everything humanly possible to win this championship. Sixer slogans prior to Cats promised trips to the championship land. But a man named Moses was needed to join Dr. J in order to get them there. Moses going to take us to the promised land. They meshed together so beautifully, personality-wise. Uh, they co complemented each other so beautifully on the basketball court. And they had one great thing in common, is they both had never won a world championship. And these were two men that were dedicated to achieving that goal together. That was a superstar. I was a superstar. And uh, it was no problem. You know, when, when I came to this team, I wanted to said with Doc team. Now, we didn't have no problem. You know, we just, it's like we just came from the same root. We just understood each other from the jump. 
Little Mo, Big Mo, The Doctor, Andrew Tony, and Ivoroni. No baloney. Sixers all the way. The Sixers had the best record in the league that year and found themselves up against an old familiar foe. This time it was no contest as the Sixers swept the Lakers in four straight for the team's first championship since 67 and the only NBA title of Julius Irving's career. Going into the locker room and watching everybody drink champagne and just deciding that I would wear it tonight and not drink it because I wanted to savor every aspect of uh, that moment and uh, be sober in doing so. That's the most outstanding moment to me. I was feeling sad at that time, but then, you know, once it was over and all said and done, I, I must admit that uh, I was very glad for Dr. J to finally get his championship ring. When AD3 rolled around, I said, if it doesn't happen now, it's never going to happen. And, uh, and it did happen, fortunately. about what we did to the NBA this year. It was absolutely beautiful. In case you're wondering why Julius did not keep his number 32 when he became a Sixer, well, the banner up there tells it all. 32 was also Billy Cunningham's number during his playing days here, and Julius then chose number six because of a six-year contract, the first he signed with the Sixers, and also because multiplying the three and the two on the old jersey came out to six. It boils down to the fact that Doc's uh, a competitor. Now, you can say that about every player in this league and so many people that play different sports. But a true competitor, and then he has a tremendous burning desire to win, and he's willing to make the sacrifices uh, to get that winning. He's a very good husband and father. You connect to a better one. We are... Uh pretty much commuted between New York and, and Philadelphia for five years. She did all the driving. And that in itself is, is quite a workload and is a statement about uh, her determination and dedication to uh, our family, my career, and uh, which has become really our career. Julius and Turquoise Irving met in Virginia his first year in the ABA. She was visiting from her home in North Carolina when a friend introduced them, February 10th, 1973. A year and a day later, they were married. The Irvings have since formed a family which many would envy. I could block you. Can? Yeah, look. Julius Irving has always been a family-oriented person. Michael has golden hands. Michael has dreams yeah. and plans yes. that issue his way out That's of enough, the Daddy. Today, he and Turquoise live in this elegant Villanova home with their four children. Cheo, age 14, Jay, who is 12, Jasmine, the only girl, is 10, and Corey, the youngest, is 5. He is the boss. <laughs> I mean, there's no doubt about that, but... I think that he would agree with me that he enjoys me having that role at, the, at whatever given time that he can't be there to fulfill that role because somebody has to do it. With Junior's career so busy, even when he's not on the road, he hasn't been able to spend much time with his family, but he has taught them... Patience. Yeah, patience. And discipline. No discipline. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the competitive Dr. J you see on the court it's quite a softy at home. Whenever they want something, they go to dad. They don't come to me because they know the answer is no. Um, you know, I'll, I'll keep firm on, a, you know, things like that. Whereas if he comes in, they can butter him up. And then he sort of feels like, uh, well, I haven't been home in a week, you know, so I'll give in to him. Sometimes I get, like, more stuff than my brothers, and sometimes the, when I'm not spoiled, like, my brothers beat me up and my mom doesn't say anything. <laughs> well, everybody else sees that I have, like, the easy life because of who my dad is, and it's not really that way. 
And it's, I mean, everything you have to work for, and it's not all give it to me on a silver platter, as many people might think. Maybe my five-year-old thinks everybody has a Dr. J in the family. He calls me Bigfoot. I just call him Doc. The Irvings don't always get many opportunities to be a regular family. I would really like to go to the mall shopping with my husband like other wives and their husbands do. I mean, my kids would like to go out and do things with their father like other kids do. But we can't really do those things because when you do them and people start to bother you, if you say no, then you're not a nice guy. Aside from often being alone to look after things at home, Turquoise holds her own job. She says people don't often realize she's more than just Mrs. Julius Irving. I don't want people to say when I walk into a room, here comes Julia Irving's wife. I want them to say, here comes Turquoise Irving. Treat me like a person. She treats Julius that way and says he likes her strong will. Oh, I get mad at him a lot of times. Not at times. A lot of times. <laughs> because I don't put him on a pedestal. I think that if you're married to a person that's in the public eye like that, if they're getting that pedestal outside of the home, they don't need it once they come home. Somebody has to bring them down to real life. Irving, the open man, and the legs are... In her own right, Turquoise Irving has become popular around the NBA. Like the rest of the Irving family, her love for basketball goes beyond watching Dr. J. Both Turquoise and Julius named former San Antonio Spur George Gervin as their favorite player. One of the few similarities between them. I don't think people see us as really a couple, and I don't think Julius and I are alike. Julius, is, Julius and I are different. I think we're so different that we uh, become a pair. Throughout his career, Julius has had the support of his wife and children. I thank God for the opportunity stand here representing turquoise and my children at this time turquoise has always been vocal and looking after the man she loved i've been very unhappy with the, the treatment that i felt that the organization gave to julius because i know that what i know what julius has given to them and um there should never have been any question of uh playing out his option year and the last couple of years, basketball has not been my life. And I could care whether they win or lose. It does not bother me at all. Uh, and I think that's because of all the changes that has happened uh, with, you know, the team. There will be changes on the Irving team very soon. Life may include Dad being around the house a bit more, though the kids aren't so sure. He may not be around much. He might probably be playing golf. One sure thing around the Irving house is that the good times will continue. Now, in the three, that there, what, mom, and dad, you know, so well, got a little inside, and then the three, the room, we like the, got screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> There's a guy that took the sport of basketball and raised it to a higher level. God bless you, Julius, and good luck in life. Dr. J, you are legendary. Thank you. After 11 years here, it'll be hard to imagine not seeing Julius Irving wearing a Sixers uniform next season. However, it would have been harder to see the doctor wearing the uniform of another team. Believe it or not, that was possible. In 1985, the Clippers didn't get far trying to land Dr. J even up for Terry Cummings. Last summer, though, the Utah Jazz came closer. When anyone wants to buy a new or used automobile in Salt Lake City, they deal with one man. Maybe you can drive my car. Larry Miller. Automobile Magnet is also owner of the NBA's Utah Jazz. Though it's clear he has closed thousands of deals for cars, his most famous deal was one that didn't work out for him. Very introspective he's become. Larry Miller wanted Julius Irving in a jazz uniform. 
and did his best to get him. But our perception going into the deal was that Philadelphia really was not that interested in keeping him. In fact, it could uh, have gone a step further, depending on who you talk to, and that they were looking for a gracious way out. Knowledgeable in basketball, Miller felt his team needed a veteran who could add stability and leadership, someone the younger players would follow. He zeroed in on Dr. J, whose contract with the Sixers had expired. I can tell you that there was never a serious consideration of ever trading Julius Serving. There was only two times ever, uh, one was a possible trade, and one was a right of first refusal, and at no time was I ever considering trading Julius Serving. Slip sliding away. To play in Utah, the Jazz were offering Julius $4 million over two years. Doc met with Larry Miller in Salt Lake City as negotiations moved quickly. Once I met him, that's when it became apparent that he was having some real, as he really contemplated the possibility of this, that he was really having some problems leaving Philadelphia. When their discussion stalled, Miller came east for his highly publicized final sales pitch. And once we got there and saw him in what I'm going to call his natural habitat, it became very apparent that if there was any way for him to continue the relationship with the Sixers, that, it, that he was going to do it. If I were going to play more than one year, uh, that would have been a better situation for me. But it would have caused a lot of difficulty in that, uh, you know, my family wasn't going to go to Utah. <laughs> my only part was that I'm not going because I felt Philadelphia was my home and, you know, this is where we were going to be. But I wanted him to do what he thought was best and I was going to be behind him 100%. Julius, can you say anything? Can you say anything at all, Doc? Uh, no, I'm sorry. He was at Harold's house and, and I could tell he was having a hard time getting out what he wanted to, so I figured I'd take a little pressure off him. I said, is there something you want to tell me? And he said, I'm going to stay here. And it hit me real hard. It didn't surprise me, but just hearing the words hit me very hard. But th I said to him, you made the right choice. Junior Serving has become a permanent fixture around Philadelphia. He's given much more to the community than his countless exceptional performances on the basketball court. Junior Serving has given up himself for the benefit of people in need. Lean on me. We for years, many charitable causes have leaned on the celebrity status of Dr. J, and he has been there to help. It's up to you. Let's all get involved. How you doing? Hi. Merry Christmas to you. Julius believes in lending more than his name. He gives his time, effort, and support whenever he can. Charity begins with um, giving of yourself, uh, giving, of, giving what you're capable of giving. He has even helped players from other teams try to overcome personal problems such as drug abuse. Julius Irving gets to Chicago, goes out to dinner with Quentin Daly to try and help this young man, try to give him a little direction, try to give him some support that he needed at that time to help that man with his life. And he wasn't looking for any accolades or uh, the media to be aware of this. This was just Julius Irving, and that's the type of person he is. Lupus is an autoimmune disease that primarily attacks women. Julius has formed a foundation to combat the disease which took his brother from him. I think it became more of a personal campaign uh, for me, more of a personal challenge to try and work with the groups um, that are involved in the research of lupus and searching for a cure and then the fact that, it, that there is no cure for it. He feels that coming to grips with the deaths of his father, brother, and the loss of his sister to cancer has acted as a waking experience for him. These catastrophes just uh, serve as uh, reminders that we're really uh, powerless as individuals and to walk around ego tripping, you know, and feeling that uh, you're totally in control of uh, your life and all the things around you is, uh, uh, is a waste. I'm sure there have been occasions when Julius Serving would have loved to lay around wasting time. Funny thing was, there was no time to do it. What will he do now that his playing days are over? To have to make a decision with what I'm going to do with the rest of my life at this stage is contradictory to the work that I've put in for the last 16 years because I've worked very hard and very genuinely and honestly for the last 16 years so I could have freedom <laughs> at this point. Yeah. 
Dr. J sold tickets and was paid a healthy salary in return for his performances. He realized that playing the game he loved was first and foremost a business. Julius is the only uh, player I've ever had who represented himself. To tell Julius Irving that um, we're not going to do something is a lot harder than telling his agents. So I think Julius, from the standpoint of being a, a businessman, is very screwed. Doc says there will be a tremendous void once his playing days are over. He insists that missing the players will not lead him into coaching. I've never wanted to be a coach. It just never occurred to me. Uh, as a matter of fact, I really don't want to work for anybody. Julius Irving says he's developed himself into an entrepreneur. He owns a number of private businesses, two marketing and management companies, and a communications company. I've enjoyed a certain celebrity status that um, you could compare with a Cosby as an actor, yet Cosby is also a celebrity and does a lot of celebrity uh, type things. Opportunities come out of celebrity status. Two out of two doctors agree. No prescription necessary. You know, I was a great basketball player when I was in college. One out of two doctors agree. He has not been involved in the operations of the Coca-Cola Philadelphia company he owns, nor the Buffalo TV station of which he is part owner. Julius has done mostly promotional and commercial work. That's where many expect him to stay. Happy to have my family and friends with me here. Happy to be here with you. Julius doesn't discount the talk that he could wind up in broadcasting as an analyst on basketball telecast. Nor does he rule out politics. Some feel mayor governor, senator, or even President Irving might have a nice ring to it. So I can't just put it on the side and say, no mas, you know, I have to, uh, I'll have to deal with it on one level or another. Though scenes like this cannot be easily confused with the elaborate Hollywood productions that win Academy Awards, Julius has been the star of his family's home movies for years. You tell me about the fish that saved Pittsburgh. Okay. This film featured the only real silver screen appearance by Julius Irving. Yeah, I, I was the one who saw that movie. I was the one who saw the fish that ate Pittsburgh. What is it? In the movie, Julius is the star of the Pittsburgh Python, a basketball team at the bottom. Wide open, man. Why you pass to him? Their 12-year-old water boy seeks the help of an astrologer who says the team must have only players with the zodiac sign of Pisces. Julius, who was born under the sign of the fish himself, goes on to lead the team to success, thereby saving basketball in Pittsburgh. There were a lot of things that I liked about it. I like the permanence of things that are put on film. And yeah, I don't, I don't rule that out. Uh, How about a I've, uh, I've, over the course of the last three or four years, read a number of scripts. Recently, Julia starred in a music video based on his own life and a song arranged and performed by Jeffrey Osborne. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing it. I think just knowing it was for someone like Dr. J was all the inspiration that I needed to really get through it. guy who I've had in my game after since I was you know, little. little uh, he's a guy that I even idolized when I got into the NBA. I caught myself watching him a lot. Uh, he's meant a lot to me uh, in growing up and just getting to the goals that I wanted to get to. You hate to see him retire because he's been such a positive force for everybody and uh, he's been, a, seems like, the spokesman for all the players and uh, I don't think we'll be able to replace him. A late great branch Ricky once said of Roy Campanella, he's as fine a man as he is a ball player, and he's all there is of both. I can't think of a more apt remark to characterize Junior Serving. I think Dr. J will make a pretty graceful transition to uh, John Q. Sixpack. If you can remember, uh, like, the best friend you've ever had, that is the way Julius is. One other thing about Junior Serving, he goes out with style, with grace goes out on top and he did it his way baseball's best basketball oh who cares i love you anyhow dr j baseball basketball i'm jewish who cares? <laughs>
I've often said when I grow up, I want to be Julius Irving. He was definitely the role model uh, for us as basketball players, for us as human beings, for us as black kids growing up. Uh, he was definitely the person that everybody looked up to and idolized and still is that person today. I can't pattern my life behind him, but I can certainly look at my life in a positive way, the way that he had done it. And uh, you know, it's, it's great uh, to be compared to him. Thank you for playing basketball the way you do and allowing us to participate in a great sport played by a great man. I refuse to treat this as though this is some uh, retirement to, uh, to the farm. This is the beginning, I think, of a very, very exciting time for Julius and his family, and I, I couldn't be happier for him. with his personality. He leads 16 years of pro ball as the third leading scorer of all time, reaching the 30,000 point plateau. <laughs> 16 times an all-star, four times the league MVP, winner of three league championships. Be happy that at this time we have only to say goodbye to Julius serving the player and not the man himself. I'm Al Meltzer. Good night. Uh, I know I can't be Dr. J on the floor, but I'm going to try to be Dr. J off the floor. And if I can do that, I know I can help a lot of people like you can help me and other young people. And also to the fans, just remember all the good times, all the walking through the air. You know, Dr. J walking, slamming, reverse, block shot, assist. And just put them in your memory bank. And just remember, Julius Irving. It's generally a sad time when someone is leaving and making an exit. Sad time for that person and for those who have been a part of it. But I would like for people to be happy for me and uh, for them to be happy, period. Uh, that. My career is coming to an end, and it's uh, allowing me to uh, walk away from the game um, and uh, move into the next phase of my life and, uh, and move in in a very encouraged way, knowing that a good job has been done and been blessed uh, for a long time.
Doc, the Julia Serving Story was sponsored in part by Jiffy Lube, America's favorite oil change and a lot more. And by your local Pontiac Pace Setter dealers. That does it for today's adventure. If you're new here, please subscribe. Take it one step further and ring that notification bell. And if you enjoyed today's video, please give it a big old like and a thumbs up. It lets me know you care. I'll see you in the next video. Right on.